Hola, what is up everybody? Welcome, good afternoon. And wanted to talk about this story that we mentioned yesterday and covered yesterday somewhat. It was a stream that we covered multiple stories. And we're back because there's been some updates. So we're going to start from the beginning. We're going to go over the timeline, the affidavit. Nancy Grace did an episode. Um, quite a few things. And also the whole thing about this guy, uh, his basement. His name is Maxwell Anderson, 34 years old. This is out of um, um, Milwaukee. Wisconsin, and this is the same place as um, Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, I think it was Jeffrey Dahmer's hometown or something. Um, and more body parts are found today. What's up, everybody? What's up? What's up? Welcome. If you guys could hit the like button as you're joining in, we did a members live earlier today. Had a pretty good time. Covered a bunch of crazy stories we're on for like two hours so make sure for the members check out the front page some people told me they didn't get a notification we're hanging out for two hours so um the updates as far as some of the things today and this is kind of what i mentioned yesterday that there were more body parts found along the uh the shore i guess uh, by the ocean Yesterday we said that I believe I don't, I don't know if, I think it was the le- yeah it was the leg that was found down like a bu- uh I forgot what to call it almost like a cliff it was ha- almost all the way down I, I don't know if he like just randomly started chucking different body parts along the way her foot was found near to where the car was which the car was burnt and she met this guy for a first time date it was a first time date in their city. Several more remains believed to be, belong to the homicide victim, Sade Robinson, were discovered along the shore. Shortly after 7.30 p.m. Thursday, a person walking along a remote tree-lined stretch of the beach south of Milwaukee discovered an arm and torso. So that's new. Um, let, me, let me just play this little video clip here and um, just kind of catch up some of the people more information about the disappearance of Shadi Robinson and the possible connection to those human remains that have been found across. Thank you, Stacy Bluff. It was about a hundred foot bluff. The area over the last 10 days. Since Shadi went missing, her family has been asking for donations for search efforts. Today, the GoFundMe says the money will be used for memorial expenses. So far, law enforcement. I'll try to find her. Um Go find me link and I'll put it in the description. ...has not confirmed Sade's death or connected her to the body parts that have been found or the person of custody, in custody in all this, Maxwell... That's an old link. ...Anderson. So our they've de- confirmed it, somewhat, com- mostly confirmed it. ...Ray walks us through link. a timeline since Sade went missing. The story begins on Monday, April 1st. That's when 19-year-old Sade Robinson was first reported missing. On Tuesday, April 2nd, family says Sade's car was found torched here near 30th and Lisbon on Milwaukee's north side that same day. Just really brings into question what is wrong with people. I'm, it's like Michigan? it's heinous. Oh, A severed you. leg was found here at Warnemont Park in Cudahy, 11 miles from Sade's burned car. On Thursday, April 4th, our crews found Milwaukee County Sheriff's deputies searching a home on Oklahoma and 39th Street. That same day, Maxwell Anderson was taken into custody and identified as a person of interest in relation to the severed leg found in Cudahy. Now, this is where things take another disturbing turn. Friday, April 5th, sheriff's deputies found more body parts near where I'm standing at 30th and Lisbon, the same location where Sade's car was found set on fire. On Saturday, April 6th, Sade's family searched that same area and found her blanket. It's devastating Mm. because um, when we came to look for her, we weren't coming looking for body parts. We were just coming to look for her. Milwaukee police came out to search again and found even more human remains. Now it's Sunday, April 7th. Sade's family comes back to search and finds human remains yet again. I want answers because I I need to know why. Isn't that crazy? Like the family finding their own 
family's body parts. And, you know, thanks to the community as well, people making reports. Somebody would want to do this to her. Let's go back to Maxwell Anderson for a second. While he has not been charged with a crime, we're naming him because of the nature of the allegations. On Tuesday, April 9th, Anderson went before a Milwaukee County judge where prosecutors asked for an extension to keep him behind bars. That extension was granted. The same night, family and friends of Sade's went back to Warnemont Park in Cudahy to search the area. She looked out for my baby. The least I could do was look out for her, her mama's baby. They say they found what they believe to be body parts, but that the sheriff's office needed to investigate further. It's now Thursday, April 11th, 11 days since Sade went missing. The sheriff's office is leading the investigation, but our phone calls and emails have gone unanswered. The DA's office confirmed charges are likely not coming today. Sade's mom tells me that once charges are filed, she plans to sit down and talk with us. I'm Jenna Ray for TMJ4 News. Okay. Um, the, the weird thing about this, there's a lot of weird things about him. There's kind of a lot of stuff we got to get into, but one of the things, and we're going to kind of bounce around from piece to piece, but Maxwell Anderson dug a big hole in his backyard that he said was an underground basement last year, said a close friend who described him as giving off weird, a weird vibe. And this is like him planning. A man drew this diagram of the Maxwell Anderson apartment, hole, fence, walkway. So I don't know if he ever got to build that underground basement that he was planning on building. You can see in his backyard, because some people took pictures of his backyard, that almost look like, let me see, where's the picture at here? He was planning on doing, like, he started some type of work back there in the backyard. Um... The police have been to that house at least twice that I know of. People were saying they need to dig up that the, the backyard. I, I don't know if this is where he was planning on starting. I, I don't know. You know, people looking at the mound in the backyard, people kind of wondering and questioning, you know, could there have been other. That's a word I don't want to open up. There, there's the mound right there. People kind of wondering, you know, I don't know, is there something else they need to dig in that backyard? Are there other victims? B12, I heard of that whole sex dungeon thing, but I, I've only heard it in the chat. I don't know if anybody's been able to send me or, or some type of link or where are people hearing that, the dungeon. And let's listen to a little bit of this interview that Nancy did with, with the victim's mother. He is beautiful. Beautiful soul. I knew that my kids were very special and different. They were, were, my parents raised me, they raised us. We are light workers. We put out positive energy, we exert, we help others. I'm a community advocate as a personal way of my life, the way I live. I, I've worked for others. I help others my whole life. I've raised my daughters that way. My daughters have excelled. I have two daughters. This has caused so much emotional effect to my family. Her, her, my parents who love my baby so much. Her grandparents, her uncles, her aunties, the community. Everyone has pulled up. This has affected many people in Milwaukee. I'm coming here today. This is the hardest thing I would ever have to do in my life to speak Shade's voice. Shade was a beautiful soul. She was an amazing girl. Nancy, everything you spoke was exactly what my daughter exerted. I couldn't have asked for any better daughter. There was things my daughter did that many adults were not even able to accomplish in their lifetime. And I'll be 43 in a week. My birthday's on April 27th. Shadi's birthday's on May the 10th. I had her on Mother's Day. The son of a... I'm going to watch my language on this platform. The son of a... Took my daughter from me. A month before she's graduating with her Associate of Arts degree. 
She works so hard. She's a full-time student. She has two full-time jobs. She has her own little bachelorette apartment. She doesn't stay in a college dorm campus. She has her own bachelorette apartment. She has her own car. She pays all of her own bills. This is traumatizing, Nancy. I never expected this to pull up on my front door. This isn't normal. This is a 2024 Jeffrey Dahmer. This is this is so I, I had Jeffrey Dahmer in the title, but my friend was kind of like, is this really Jeff like a Jeffrey Dahmer type of thing? Because Jeffrey Dahmer did all this stuff like cannibalize and like try to do all this crazy shit and store the you know, whatever. I think I, I think because of the state and location, it's the same location. There's somewhat it made me think of Jeffrey. Like I couldn't help but think of Jeffrey. You know, and I, I still wonder, you know, is this this guy's first victim, his first time, or or has he done this before? How would he pull this off? You know, has he pulled this off successfully before? Could it be had targeted, um, you know, uh, like a sex worker or something that maybe people would pay less attention to in the past? I don't know. Or maybe it is his first time. I need him held accountable. I need justice for Sade. There has been a lot of in a many black and brown girls that have been gone missing in Milwaukee for a moment. And all of them are going to be held accountable now because they put they mess with the wrong family. They mess with the wrong family because we're not going to sit quiet and we're not going to sit still. And we're going to call all of them out and we're going to speak for the whole community because I'm not about to sit down. and I'm not about to sit still on this one. It's justice for Sade, Nancy. It's justice. Miss Scarborough, I feel like anything, anything I or anybody on this panel could say right now, it, it pales compared to what you just said. Natalie said this guy probably idolizes Jeffrey Dahmer. There was a case that we covered, if you guys remember in the chat, some of you might remember, Taylor Show Business. You guys remember Taylor Show Business? I know the people that I hear on a regular basis remember. Taylor Show Business, what state was she in? Was she in the same state? What state was she in? Taylor Show Business. No, they were in, the, they were in Wisconsin as well. Okay. That's why I'm like, Jeffrey pops in my head. But like, again, my, I took it out of the title because my friend was telling me like, it's not the same or it's not comparable, but it, I don't know. I can't help but think of Jeffrey, but Taylor's a business. Okay. And she only, as far as we know, she only killed one person, her, her boyfriend or, or boy toy for the people that don't know they were getting high on meth in a basement and the mother, his the, the boyfriend's mother was sleeping upstairs. And at some point, I, I guess he was restrained. And she has a chain around his neck and she's squeezing it tighter and tighter and tighter and he can't breathe and he's gasping. And I think blood starts to come out. And I think she described it as her, his, his chest was like pumping or whatever. And she just kept squeezing because she liked it. And uh, she killed him right there. Continued to have sex with him for, I think, for a couple of hours. I don't, I don't know how long. I don't remember. And kept doing stuff to him. His bottom parts, both sides, everywhere, and then dismembered him and drained the blood, I think, into a bucket. And I think put the head into a bucket and also put his his phallus, his bottom part in a bucket as well. And dismembered him. And I, I think she got rid of some of the body parts and whatever. And later on that night, I guess, or in the morning, sometime mother comes downstairs to check on her son, see what's going on. And she finds her son's head in a bucket and as well as his, his other thing. And Taylor's a business idolized Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay. And even took a picture. I'm trying to find the picture right now. I, I was, that was so wild because that during the trial, they didn't want to bring it in. I think I even have a clip somewhere. I knew it. I was like, I knew this, this, this B word was, was twisted. She over here posing with this guy as like an idol type of shit. You find this picture. None of these pictures want to save. Hold on a second. There we go. Let me save this picture. 
This chick over here posing with this shit. For anybody that doesn't remember that, and they didn't want to let that come into the, the trial. And even when she was being interrogated, I believe she was kind of laughing. She didn't care. She killed the dismembered the guy or whatever. This lady attacked her attorney. You guys remember that? She she had an attorney representing her. She jumped on the guy and attacked his ass. Her own attorney. And believe me, Miss Scarborough, this story of Sade has not just touched people in Milwaukee. It has touched people around the world. And when you say you're not going to sit back, neither are we until there is justice for your girl and the other missing and murdered girls across Milwaukee. They're not all just missing. They're dead. Many of exactly. them are dead. So Guys, with me is Sade's mother, who is in so much pain, but she is joining us tonight to speak out for Sade. What happened? What led up to this night? Yes, Nancy, this is, yes. Nancy, the last time I spoke to my daughter was on Easter Sunday, okay? We seen her. She came by my parents' home. We spent the Sunday together. This was Easter Sunday, okay? Um, I cooked for them. Both of my daughters, we all met by my parents' house where I'm currently at. We all commute here. All my girls are busy. They're, my youngest is 16. They have a lot of activities. They're working. They go to school. I have very successful and independent, self-sufficient daughters. Okay, so that, that's a snippet she posted. We're going to listen to Nancy's podcast episode that just dropped. But before we do that, we're going to get into this um, the, the affidavit. It's very detailed. It has a lot of information. We might jump a little bit. Let's see, it's page two. Okay. So first degree intentional homicide, Anderson Maxwell, he's the perp. And let's get here. Discovery of severed human leg in Warnament Park. On Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024, at around 529 p.m., members of law enforcement, including Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office, Goodhay Police Department, responded to the 5400 South Lake Drive to a report of a human leg located on the beach. First responders led by the citizen who called police to the leg. Responding deputies located the right leg of what appeared to be a black female. The severed leg just below the hip socket and appeared to have been sawn off. The toes on the feet had pink nail polish. The leg did not appear to be decomposing. So this is like, you know, fresh. I mean, this was literally, we're going to get into it more. They find the body parts the day after um, she has a date with this guy. Deputy Leon Martin was one of the first responding deputies. Deputy Martin spoke to the EM, the probably emergency medical, or maybe the person that actually found it, who discovered the leg. EM stated this initials, stated he was meeting his friend at the park. EM stated that. He and his friend were walking towards the beach slash water, and they saw the leg just north of Wanamant Park or Wanamant Pump House at the shoreline. Deputy Martin reports that the area where the leg was located contains a bluff that is approximately 100 feet tall. The leg was originally found about two thirds of the way down the bluff towards the water's edge. So this is what I was kind of mentioned yesterday. Like to me, it's like. I think this guy was just literally walking to the edge of these bluffs and, and like toss him. He was even seen on video. A bluff is like, let me just, I want to try to show you a bluff. 
show you what it kind of for anybody that doesn't know. It's kind of like a, like a cliff or something, like a minute, like a drop off, you know. Can't find it now, but let me show you this guy's real too, real quick. Hopefully, it's not too confusing. But yesterday, I started kind of mapping off a little bit of the area, areas. Um. So Maxwell lived over here. He didn't live kind of too far from her. He lived down here. Okay, but Sade. Um, I believe she was up here to the north, close to the downtown area. And the place they went to go, one of the places they went to go eat was close to her. But where the leg was found, that cliff thing that we're talking about, the the bluff, that was all the way down here. What you say, Warnament Golf Course, Warnament, whatever, in this area, and there's a pump house. I don't know exactly where along the shoreline is the pump house. I don't know if it's this. I don't know if like this is the bluff or whatever. Like I don't know if anybody out there in uh, this area maybe could probably tell me. I'm assuming maybe that's the bluff, but I'm not sure. So the leg and other body parts started to come find, be found down there. He basically drove up and down. Because the car was found over here in this area. And the foot was found not too far from there. In this 1819, this is where the car was found burnt. And the foot was found not too far from there. This area right there. Oh, I think her car was found there in 1819. Or vice versa. The car was found there and the foot was found there close in the proximity. It was found close to each other. And then he took the bus from there. But anyway, so yeah, the leg is found down this bluff. About a hundred, it's about a hundred feet tall, two thirds of the way down. Uh, Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office Detective Nathan Spittlemeister searched the area for the of the park for any cameras that may have captured something related to the discarded of the leg. Detective located a video from Kude High School that shows the parkways nearest to the pump house at the shoreline. The road that leads to the pump house is closed to vehicle traffic by a gate secured by the padlock and chain. The video footage shows at approximately 2.53. Oh, thank you. Shelly Ray in the chat says that's the pump house. All right, I appreciate you clearing that up. Um, at approximately 2.53 a.m., a vehicle entering the video frame heading eastbound on the parkway toward the road to the pump house the video shows that the vehicle did not make a southbound or northbound turn once reaching the intersection nearest to the service road. The vehicle disappears from the video footage consistent with the vehicle driving down the road that leads to the pump house. Complainant knows this service road to the pump house would be the furthest that a car could go to get near Lake Michigan. As, as you guys have been telling me in the chat. I don't know why. I thought it was like a... I, don't know, I was thinking like an ocean, which is big, but let me see. Oh, yeah, it's a big ass lake. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so this is where we're talking about right now. This area right here and the pump house. Like somebody said in the chat, I believe it's right here. I, I, I guess he tried to drive down this way, I guess. So I don't know the furthest he could drive. This is the pump house. And. The first that a car could go near Lake Michigan in that area. Detectives spoke to Kure Police Detective Brian Olson, who informed Detective Spittlemeister that on the morning of April 2nd, 2024, employees of Kure Water Department reported that the service gate had been struck by a vehicle. And that's someone like, why, why would he? Why? <laughs> you know, like the damage to the gate was done after the evening of April 1st and before the morning of April 2nd. This is consistent with the vehicle seen on video. So I don't know why this guy driving around. And by the way, he, he's driving her vehicle. He left his vehicle home. He has, I guess, body parts. I, I don't know how he's you know, carrying it. I don't know what kind of what way he stores it or whatever. Driving in her car. I don't know if he did that. Like, did he do it on purpose? Trying to make it seem like somebody, you know, I don't know. Or was it just an accident? So this is cons consistent with the vehicle seen on video. 
Detective Joseph Blanchard from the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office went to the pump house gate and recovered broken pieces of a vehicle that were determined to belong to a Honda Civic. So that's Sade's vehicle. These damaged pieces would be consistent with the vehicle ramming the gate to get through. I guess he just ran to get past there. I guess he, I guess he didn't. Lord, thank you for the membership. He drove that road and crashed into the gate. Man. Detective also recorded a video from the pump house that faces north in the direction of where the severed leg was recovered. At approximately 3.02 a.m., a human figure can be seen descending the bluff to the beach level. The figure appears to make multiple attempts to walk between the beach and the service drive for the pump house. At approximately 4.31 a.m., the vehicle that entered the closed gate leaves and ultimately leaves the park heading westbound. The leg was recovered and transferred transported to the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office, but examined by the doctor. Based on the size of the leg, the estimated height of the person would be five feet tall. There were multiple cutting impressions around the amputation point, as well as sharp force trauma to the exposed femur bone. However, the top of the femur bone appeared to have been snapped off. The leg appeared to have been intentionally severed with a sharp instrument including the bone being sawn halfway through. Rosewood, thank you for the membership. So, Sade reporting missing. Or shot, they keep saying Sade. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's Sade. I keep wanting to say Sade, but Sade. At approximately 9 p.m. April 2nd, a walk-in report is made by AJ at the police department aj reported that her friend Sade had been had not returned had not been returning aj's calls and not showed up for work i think she worked at a pizza place aj provided her phone number for robinson sorry i forgot the thought i got that one and she's deceased but i try to you know and reported she lived at the address on april 3rd 2024 milwaukee police officer nora burlo responded to robinson's apartment to conduct a welfare check and was not able to make contact with Robinson. AJ further reported to the investigators that the last known activity for Robinson was to a Snapchat that AJ viewed showing Robinson at Dukes on the Water. Uh, this is the address for the restaurant. On the evening of April 1st, no further contact had been made with Robinson. So Dukes on the Water. Let's see. Dukes on the water is up here close to where Shade lives. Dukes on the water. So right here, I mean, close to her home. That was where the Snapchat was sent from. Okay. Upon hearing the discovery of the leg near Wonderment Park, Officer Burlo contacted the police department to inform them of the report of Robinson being missing as well as the vehicle fire. Complainant knows through contact that the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office has had with Robinson's family and friends that Robinson is approximately five feet tall. Complainant knows that Robinson's listed height with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation is five feet tall. Officer Burlow, as well as the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office, Deputy Joseph Blanchard, made contact with the employees of Robinson's apartment building. The apartment's maintenance employee, EF, indicated that he had last seen Robinson on April 1st. Another employee, building secretary, CAS, reported that she would frequently see and speak with Robinson. And Robinson told CAS that she was excited for a date that she had the evening of April 1st. The detective also reviewed video surveillance from the apartment building and said the footage depicts Robinson leaving the building at 9 a.m. on April 1st. Robinson is wearing a puff, a black puffy coat, a white shirt, light colored blue jeans with multiple tears in front and white shoes. So. Discovery of a Honda Civic. And so furthermore, on April 2nd, 2024, 732 a.m. So this is the day after the fire department responded to this address. For a vehicle on fire, first responders located a 2020 Honda Civic 
The vehicle had been had sustained extreme fire damage, completely damaging the interior of the Civic. A check of the vehicle registration revealed that the car belongs to Robinson. Items discovered in the vehicle, as well as described later in this complaint, were found. Complainant states on information and belief that the vehicle is worth more than $100. So the 1819... Let's see here. Yeah, this is where the vehicle is found, burnt. Just like on the street here. Robinson's phone records in response to uh, of the human leg at Ornament Park as well as the similar timing of Robinson's reported missing, as well as the arson of her vehicle. I mean, this guy is pretty messy. This uh, alleged killer, Maxwell Anderson. I guess he was trying to cover up his, his tracks, but did a horrible job. I mean, he one of the places was his job that they made up. They met up at. And his one of his coworkers were even there. And there's video of them at this place. I mean, I don't know what this guy was thinking. Anyway, sheriff's office obtained records from Verizon Wireless, the servicer for the number of Robinson 414. It should be noted that AJ, as well as the family members of Robinson, confirmed the number belonged to her. Detective reports that records received from Verizon that include call detail records, location records, as well as recent text messages. Upon review of the text message content, detective Vander T located a text conversation between Robinson and the phone number 262, which I believe is Maxwell. This was the last text message conversation in the records that contained outgoing messages for Robinson. The conversation occurred between 4.15 p.m. and 5.18 p.m. April 1st. Where are we meeting? I can do five. And then says, hmm, downtown somewhere. She says, okay. And she lives in the close to the downtown area, if not in there. Then responds, Brad House on third. Uh, perfect. Okay, I'm going to take a quick shower. I'll probably get there more around 515. Are you hungry? I need to stop at Twisted Fisherman to pick up my W-2. So this Twisted Fisherman. Winnie, thank you so much for the 10 memberships. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. So this twisted fisherman, he says he well, we need to stop there to get my W two and we can eat there first. He works there. Twisted fisherman is not that far from Dukes on the Water. It's right down here. It's this twisted fisherman right here. The guy works over here. I don't know if we could see it from here. Twisted Fisherman. Can't really get a real big, better, good view of it, but there's a sign right there. So it says, okay, and yes, are we eating at the Brad House or other place? Let's eat at Twisted. I'm feeling seafood. Yes, I love seafood. Sounds good. I'm about to leave. Be there soon. And then says, okay, with all these little weird stuff. I don't know. Just got to Twisted. Okay, are you inside? Yes. So law enforcement databases showed an association between 262 and Maxwell Anderson, the defendant above. Upon checking the booking records, defendant provided that phone number to the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office during booking process April 2023. So on a previous incident, whatever happened, he provided that same phone number before, so it matches. Investigators then checked Wisconsin Department of Transportation records, which revealed defendants list address of whatever street in the city of, of Milwaukee. Milwaukee County Sheriff Detective John Gillett responded to Twisted Fisherman located at this address to attempt to determine if Robinson went to that location. Detective Gulliet recovered surveillance video from Twisted Fisherman. Complainant has reviewed that video as well and has also reviewed booking photos of defendant as well as photographs of Sade. The video shows in sum as follows at approximately 
5.09 p.m. on April 1st, the defendant enters Twisted Fisherman from the west. He, his face is clearly visible on exterior cameras of the restaurant. At 5.20 p.m., Robinson enters the restaurant from the east, then approaches the bar and sits next to the defendant. The defendant and Robinson remain at the bar eating and having drinks together until they leave the restaurant around 6.24 p.m. They both leave towards the east. So, um, the defendant entered from the west and she entered from the east. So they go towards her vehicle. They leave walking. Maybe he's walking her to her car, which is the direction of Robinson arrived. Robinson is still wearing a black puffy coat, white shirt, light colored blue jeans, multiple tears in front, white shoes. And she's carrying a dark grayish brown purse. The defendant is wearing, sorry, the defendant is wearing his hair in a ponytail a red flannel coat, a gray hood, and a black t-shirt with car hat written in white across the chest, as well as dark jeans. There are no cameras at Twisted Fisherman that depict the parking lot. So we don't know what happened in the parking lot. This guy works there. He knows there's cameras. He's got to know there's cameras there. I, I, I would assume he was plotting and planning this, unless, unless this was just like a sporadic thing that he when he decided to murder her. I don't know. I mean, why, why would you do that? You're planning on killing somebody. I don't, I don't know. Detective Gulliet, when recovering the video, spoke to the owner of the restaurant, RD, who stated that he knew the defendant. Okay, he was an, as an ex-employee, so he used to work there. Okay. Detective Gulliet, and we're going to get more into the defendant's history, too. There was a good article that has a lot, some of his work history and stuff. Detective Gulli also spoke to JR, one of the managers of the Twisted Fisherman. JR viewed the surveillance video and identified the male subject with Robinson as a defendant who JR knew as a former employee and further stated that the defendant came in to get his W-2, consistent with the text conversation. Detective Gulli also spoke to BC, who was the bartender who served the defendant and Robinson. BC stated that the defendant initially came in and indicated he was picking up his W-2, but then informed BC that he was staying at the Twisted Fisherman to meet a female for a first date. BC knew the defendant as a former employee. BC stated that Robinson arrived and sat with the defendant and they appeared to have casual conversation before leaving together. Brian Conte, a detective, conducted an interview April 3rd with ASF, who identified herself as a friend of Robinson. ASF indicated to Detective Conte that she became aware of Robinson missing by seeing it on the news. ASF stated that after she learned Robinson was missing, she accessed Robinson's Life360 app on her cell phone. That Life360 app, so to me, it's pretty interesting. I, I think like if you have a family, it's probably worth getting. Just because you hear these crazy situations going on and it gives so much details about like the person's device. Did it actually run out of battery or was it did somebody shut it down? I think Riley Strain. I think they had something like that. Um so it's a it's a pretty useful app that you you know if you, if something happens to a family member or loved one, you can locate them. She observed that Robinson's phone appeared to be in Warnament Park around 4.33 a.m. on April 2nd. Complaint knows investigators received Life360 records from ASF as well as Robinson's mother, SLS. The Life360 accounts belong to Robinson also linked to her phone number mentioned above. And so they reviewed all this stuff. 4-1-2024 between 5.05 and 8.29 or sorry, 6.29 uh, they were at the 1126 Canal Street. From 629 to 835, the device traveled from the 595 West Claiborne Street to the 1137 North Water Twisted Fisherman to the area of Dukes on the Water. So from the area of 595 Clyburn, Twisted Fisherman to Dukes on the Water. So they went from his previous place of employment to this new place. His previous place of employment, so Twisted Fisherman, to then Dukes in the Water. Kind of all relatively close, and also close to where Sade lives. So they go to Dukes in the Water. From, 
So let me see. That was from 629 to 635. I guess they're traveling. From 704 to 906, two hours. Near Dukes on the water. I guess they're in that area. From 906 to 928. The device traveled from 1215 North Water Street to was in the area of South 40th and West Oklahoma. Dukes on the water to the area of Anderson's residence. Okay. Okay. So from Dukes on the water, her device traveled from there to his house. Okay. Then, 4 1 and 4 2, the dates, April 1st and April 2nd, from 9 28 p.m. to 12 48 a.m., three hours, three hour time, they're at this address, I guess. At four, uh, on 4 2, at 12 48 to 1 38 a.m., the device travels from, I guess, the house, from Anderson's residence to northbound to, and eastbound to a roadway adjacent to Pleasantville Valley near Kern Park on the Milwaukee River, River in the Milwaukee River West neighborhood. That Kern Park, I don't know if I pulled it up in the map or not. I might have, I might have not. Kern Park. Let's see if I can do that. Kern Park. Okay, I'm not sure. Well, let me see. Does it have the exact location there? Kern Park. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Pleasantville, Pleasant Valley. What the hell is that? I'll leave that out for now. I'm not sure exactly where that place is at. Pleasant Valley. And so it was there, and then from 1.38 a.m. to 2.01, 23 minutes, near the Gordon Place. And then from 2.01 to 2.53, the device traveled from 38.29 Humboldt Boulevard to 52.52 South Lake Drive, the Humboldt area adjacent to the Milwaukee River. Let's see. Okay. Going to Waterman Park, which is the area where the leg was found. Okay. From 3.24 a.m. to 4.35 a.m., the device was stationary in a stretch of Waterman Park that encompasses the location where the leg was found. That's where all these body parts are being found now. From 3.24 a.m. to 4.35 a.m., an hour and 11 minutes, near 5152 Sheridan Drive, and then at 4.35 a.m., Life360 notes the battery of the device has died. Complaint states that on April 4, 2024, investigators with the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office executed a search warrant for the defendant's residence. So now they're searching the guy's house. And Kern Park is off Humboldt and Keefe Avenue. Okay. I think I did see a Humboldt. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I actually do see it here. I wonder why, why they were all the way up there. Humboldt. There's Humboldt. And I saw Keefe Avenue somewhere. Yeah, oh, there we go. Keefe Avenue. Okay. That's by the, this little stretch of the Milwaukee River there. The execution of the search warrant, search warrant identifiers for the defendant were located, including packages addressed to the defendant. Additionally, Blood was located on bedding in one of the bedrooms and on the walls leading towards the basement. So that's what I was wondering. And I, we should look. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the. Okay, let me do this. The mods. I don't know if there's any active. Yeah, we got BL. I don't know if Mo's in the chat either. I don't know if Mo's kind of good with this. But I'm going to drop the address in the admin chat on Discord. I'm curious about like the, the flooring plans. Because he. Why would he talk about building a basement if he has a basement now unless he wanted like a separate thing on the outside 
Let me just drop this in the admin chat. Okay, one second. Okay. All right, so... Oh, man, check this out. Several gasoline containers are located in the garage and storage area. So, blood located on the bedding in one of the bedrooms. And on the walls. And uh, the thing I was wondering, too, like, I, I don't know, like, did he just surprise attack her or did he drug her? Like, like, like Jeffrey, like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer would kind of, he'd have his, his victims come to the place. He'd pick up these people like from these bars sometimes or like going out. Let's go back to my place. I forgot. What, what was Jeffrey Dahmer drugging people with? That's one thing I want to know. I kind of forgot that, but he would drug people, put them in the, put it in the drinks and have a cocktail or he'd surprise them too. I think, right? Just surprise them, attack them. Surprised to because I, 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 I thought when I watched the Netflix documentary, he, he'd sometimes like pull out a gun and be like, tie your hands up type of thing, right? I remember there was one scene where he was in a hotel with somebody and accidentally he drugged himself. And he, he kind of like passed out. The other person passed out from like being drunk at some point in the middle of, of his being passed out, he wakes up and like kills the person still and then wakes up and almost kind of forgot he did it. Oh, a sedative, right? Okay, a sedative. All right. Complainant knows that the Verizon records from Robinson's phone number, which included call detail records and location information, were analyzed by investigators. The records consistent with the Life 360 information described above show Robinson's device in the area of Twisted Fisherman when Robinson is with a defendant at the location. Additionally, the records show the device moved to the area of Dukes in the Water at approximately 6.30 p.m. And around 9.20 p.m., the device is in the area of the defendant's residence. I mean, this is kind of like hook, line, line, and sinker, you know, like with all the data information that they have. Complainant knows that the Milwaukee Police Department, Jake Pushnig, re reviewed the pole camera video in the area of Dukes on the Water, the footage shows Robinson's Honda Civic arrive at 6.33 p.m. And at 6.34 p.m., Robinson exits the driver's door and the defendants exit the front passenger's door. Sorry, the defendant. The defendant exits the... Well, let me read that again. I'm confused here. So the detective reviewed the pole camera video footage in the area of Dukes on the Water. That footage shows Robinson's Honda Civic arrive at 6.33 p.m. And at 6.34, Robinson exits the driver's door and the defendant exits the passenger door. Okay. Because by this time, they had come from the twisted place. So this, oh, so they drove together. They drove together. Yeah, they drove together. Oh, okay. The two of them then walk across the street and eventually walk in the direction of Dukes in the Water. Detective Pushnig also reviewed the video footage from Dukes in the Water, which depicts the defendant and Robinson hanging out at Dukes in the Water. The pole camera video then shows Robinson and the defendant return to Robinson's vehicle and the driveway at 9.04 p.m. Okay, return to the defendant's vehicle and drive away. Drive away at 9.04 p.m., after that, the phone records show the following. Robinson's phone remains in the area of Anderson's residence until about 12.45 a.m. Okay, on April 2nd. Then between 12.45 and 1 a.m., the device appears to travel northbound and eastbound towards the direction of downtown Milwaukee, back towards her house, towards her area, back towards those restaurants. From 1 a.m. to approximately 1.15 a.m., the phone is in the area of the downtown Milwaukee of downtown Milwaukee, including the area of Robinson's apartment before heading northbound consistent with traveling into the River West neighborhood between 115 and 130 a.m. It should be noted that between these records, the Life 360 location information, the phone does not appear to be stationary in this time frame. Complaint further notes that the detective Blanchard reviewed the video footage of Robinson's apartment complex and confirmed Robinson did not return to her apartment at any point 
after being at the defendant's residence. At approximately 1.33 a.m., the phone travels north towards the area of Pleasant Valley Park near Humboldt. There you go. Thank you for the person in the chat. Near Humboldt and Keefe Avenue. So, I, I don't know. What's he doing all the way up here? So, this is near Kern Park, Humboldt, and Keefe Avenue, right? This is all the way up here. This guy lives down here by the 31 thing. So, he, he drove all the way, and we're assuming driving in her vehicle with the dismembered body parts. Drives all the way up here, past the restaurants, past her house, to this area. I, w I wonder what he was doing up here. You know, I don't know, was he getting rid of the weapon, murder weapon, or, or something? Okay, so after going up there from 133, the phone travels north to, oh, to the area of Pleasant Valley Park. Okay. Where it remains approximately until 2 a.m. So about, okay. From 2 a.m. to, to 10 a.m., the phone appears to travel westbound consistent with being on or near Capitol Drive as it moves west. From 212 to 220, the phone moves back eastbound in the area of Capitol Drive. The Lord only knows what he's doing. From 220 a.m. to 230 a.m., the phone appears to travel southbound consistent with traveling on Interstate 43. From 2.30 a.m. to 2.35 a.m., the phone moves westbound, appearing to travel consistent with Interstate 41 and Interstate 894 towards Greenfield. From 2.35 a.m. to 2.45, sorry, 2.35 a.m. to 2.45 a.m., 2.35 to 2.45, the phone moves back eastbound and then southbound consistent with traveling on Interstate 41 and Interstate 94 and then traveling eastbound in the area of College Avenue in the direction of Waterman Park. From 2.45 to 3 a.m., the phone appears to be east of the airport in the area of Kure in South Milwaukee. The phone remains in the area of Waterman Park from 3 to 4.30 a.m. So he was there for like an hour and a half, quite a bit of time. That's where quite a bit of the body parts are found by the water area. From 4.30 to 4.40 a.m., the phone begins to move northbound towards St. Francis and then has a final cell tower location of around 4.40 a.m. in the area of East Howard Avenue and WI-794, consistent with the location where three, like the Life360 app indicates the battery of the phone has died. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I need a little break from reading, so let me let me do a little. Um, let's do some Nancy Grace. This is a new episode, and then we'll come back. We're almost done with the document. This discovery of the human remains. We got left. Discovery of that. This guy eventually. You know, we'll talk about it, but eventually. Burns the vehicle, lights it up, and then takes the bus. And there was a witness that saw him burn the vehicle. I mean, this guy has seen so many times. He's tracked on GPS. He's seen on video. Like, it's just, it's crazy. Let's see. Okay. Crazy. I want to play on this browser. Let me do the other one. Zen nicotine pouches deliver nicotine. Making today's program started today at Dexcom.com. De Big fan of charter of a beautiful Zen nicotine. Thank you to our part brand. It's issues counting your steps, you know. A crack in the. All right. So, yeah, this is the latest, one of the latest episodes, I believe. And, um,. I'm really curious about this guy's family. The the this guy's family did put out a statement, by the way, and they just gave like their sincere condolences and stuff like that. Yeah, like apologize, but like, uh, uh, and this guy's Facebook is already taken down. I was trying to look at his Facebook. Kind of curious about this guy's history, which I do have an article that talks about that. The disappearance and dismemberment murder 
of a beautiful teen girl, Sade Robinson, did the spoiled brat son of a Milwaukee millionaire mm. lure Sade on a date turned murder? I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories, and I want to thank you for being with us. 5.30 p.m. April 2nd, Cudahy police respond to a call along Lake Michigan. At Warnemont Park, a popular recreation area, a park goer reports finding a severed human leg. According to a post from Cudahy Sheriff's Office, the limb was found in or near the water east of the golf course near the pump house. There are steep cliffs leading to the shoreline in that area and large numbers of... Since Nancy brought it up, Let's talk a little bit, sidestep for a second, about this the killer, the alleged killer. On Facebook, Anderson describes himself as a bartender at the Rave slash Eagles Club, although a friend and other social and others on social media say he was working more recently at Victor's Nightclub, where many people appear to remember him from. Maxwell Anderson is 33, according to his jail records. He's also known as Maxwell S. Anderson or Max Anderson. The family has ties to Waukesha County. Anderson's father runs a major group and of insurance agencies in multiple states, according to his LinkedIn. An old address for the Maxwell Anderson for Maxwell Anderson in court records lists to an I don't even know how to say that Okonomowoc Lake home with an estimated value of nearly three million. All right. Oh, they're freezing again. Police canvassed the area and kept away gawkers. Three days after the Warnemont Park discovery, another call to police about a severed body part. 11 miles away from the shores of Lake Michigan in a Milwaukee West Side neighborhood, a body part is found at a playground. Within 24 hours, police respond to another call about the discovery of human remains. On Saturday, just a few blocks from the same West Side Milwaukee area as Friday's discovery, police set up a crime scene near a park. After a car is found on fire, paired with a pet tribute blanket found mm -hmm. near some of the human remains, police begin to focus on a beautiful young teen girl Sade listen Sade Robinson graduates with honors a semester early from Riverside High School she continues her education at Milwaukee Area Technical College working towards her associate's degree in criminal justice in fact she's only a month away from graduating but Robinson hasn't been spending all her times in the books she works through high school and college at the pizza shuttle on Milwaukee's Lower East Side she makes such a difference at work that her co-workers say Robinson is considered the heart of pizza shuttle former owner Mark Gold says she is the type of employee who never calls out out and is loved by customers and her co-workers. Robinson is heavily influenced by her family. With many family members serving in the military, Sade Robinson wants to look at career opportunities available for her in the United States Air Force. Joining me is a very special guest along with an all-star panel, seriously, the Brain Trust. But just hearing uh, Holden Zappel speaking from CrimeOnline.com about Sade, she's everything you want your child to be. She's this fantastic student. She is working while she's going to school. Very close family. Tons of relatives in the military. And she is inspired to consider the U.S. Air Force. I mean, this is the girl we all want to have. I remember my grandmother, I would give her my school picture every year, and she could say, I can just see, see the mischief coming out of your eyes. Look at this girl. Can't you just see the joy, the, just the love of life, crackling smart, just beaming out of her? How in the world did she collide, cross paths with an alleged spoiled brat killer, the son of a Milwaukee millionaire? Crazy. A former ex-high school 
football star, now a 30-something bartender. In addition to our all-star panel of trial lawyer Eric Faddis, renowned psychologist Dr. John Della Torre, death investigator Professor Joe Scott Morgan, and investigative crime reporter Alexis Terezchuk, a special guest joining me. This is Sade's mother, Miss Sheena Scarborough. You know, Miss Miss Scarborough, whenever I have to travel for work, my backpack is so heavy because I have all these mementos of the twins I carry with me and set up wherever I am. I know I hear you talk about your twins a lot. It's It's just killing me to think that you have this picture instead of your girl. First of all, tell me about Sade. Sade is a beautiful, beautiful soul. I, I know that my kids were very special and different. They we're, were my parents raised me. They raised us. We are light workers. We put out positive energy. We exert. We help others. I'm a community advocate. As a personal way of my life, the way I live, I I've worked for others. I help others my whole life. I've raised my daughters that way. My daughters have excelled. I have two daughters. This has caused so much emotional effect to my family, her, her, my parents who love my baby so much, her grandparents, her uncles, her aunties, the community. Everyone has pulled up. This has affected many people in Milwaukee. I'm coming here today. This is the hardest thing I would ever have to do in my life to speak Shadi's voice. Shadi was a beautiful soul. She was an amazing girl. Nancy, everything you spoke was exactly what my daughter exerted. I couldn't have asked for any better daughter. There was things my daughter did that many adults were not even able to accomplish in their lifetimes. And I'll be 43 in a week. My birthday's on April 27th. Shadi's birthday's on May the 10th. I had her on Mother's Day. The son of a, I'm going to watch my language on this platform. The son of a took my daughter from me a month before she's graduating with her associate of arts degree. She works so hard. She's a full-time student. She has two full-time jobs. She has her own little bachelorette apartment. She doesn't stay in a college dorm campus. She has her own bachelorette apartment. She has her own car. She pays all of her own bills. This is traumatizing, Nancy. I never expected this to pull up on my front door. This isn't normal. This is a 2024 Jeffrey Dahmer. I need him held accountable. I need justice for Sade. There has been a lot of, in a many black and brown girls that have been gone missing in Milwaukee for a moment. And all of them are going to be held accountable now because they put, they messed with the wrong family. They messed with the wrong family because we're not going to sit quiet and we're not going to sit still. And we're going to call all of them out and we're going to speak for the whole community. Because I'm not about to sit down and I'm not about to sit still on this one. It's justice for Sade, Nancy. It's justice. Miss Scarborough, I feel like anything, anything I or anybody on this panel could say right now, it, it pales compared to what you just said. And believe me, Miss Scarborough, this story of Sade has not just touched people in Milwaukee. It has touched people around the world. And when you say you're not going to sit back, neither are we until there is justice for your girl and the other missing and murdered girls across Milwaukee. They're not all just missing. They're dead. Many of them are dead. Exactly. Guys, with me is Sade's mother, who is in so much pain, but she is joining us 
tonight to speak out for Sade. What happened? What led up to this night? Nancy, the last time I spoke to my daughter was on Easter Sunday, okay? We seen her. She came by my parents' home. We spent the Sunday together. This was Easter Sunday, okay? Um, I cooked for them. Both of my daughters, we all met by my parents' house where I'm currently at. We all commute here. All my girls are busy. They're, my youngest is 16. They have a lot of activities. They're working. They go to school. I have very successful and independent, self-sufficient daughters. We harm and hurt nobody. We just put out and help others into the universe, okay? So I see, like, she is just very, it's like, she's a 19, 20-year-old young lady, okay? We all, at this age, we have a lot of friends. She's not in a relationship. She didn't have a boyfriend. She wasn't tied down to anyone. She's single and she's dating. I knew she hung out with her co-workers at Pizza Shuttle. Um, they went out to little bars and hung out sometimes. I'm a very concerned mother. I'm very overprotective. I always would put in Shade's ear, be careful. I don't trust these people around Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. I'm just that extra type of mom. And my daughter's always, mom, just sit back. I try to give them space, let them be independent. But I've just been having this vibe and intuition. And I have been wanting her just to, like, not hang out and go out to places for some reason. And I don't know exactly, and I'm still trying to find out the facts. But I know that this type of indi this individual, and I want to make clarity because there's been a lot of trolls there's been a lot of media i can't interact and deal with i'm grieving my daughter right now i want respect i need time i'm gonna this is about advocating not only for my daughter but for all of the young women that are missing and for the actions that have been taken to find my daughter and just there's a lot of information but i need the community and people to know that my daughter helps others she was a positive spirit welcome to the street this, this like did they they're claiming this was a first date like you know it's just a first date i don't this dude never she never mentioned this dude to us well we're learning a little bit about that take a listen to dave mack crime online a month away from turning 20 Shade robinson tells a maintenance worker at her building that she's excited about her first date with 33 year old maxwell anderson robinson texts anderson about where to eat and tells him she's feeling seafood. Anderson takes Sade to a place he used to work, the Twisted Fisherman. After dinner, they spend some more time together having drinks at Dukes on Water. The couple leaves Dukes together around 9 p.m. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Want to get fit, but... Actually went out because... Uh I just think about too, like going on this date with this guy having like killer, allegedly killer intentions, how he's able to like mask of like, hey, hi, yeah, oh, yeah, let's go for a drink and let's go to my place. I want to pick up our W2 and yeah, we're eating, drinking. You got to, you know, I, I don't know if people do that all the time, I guess, on dates, but to have that kind of intention. But all, be, 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 but be like tricking somebody and smiling with them and, and you know breaking bread and like having food and drinking. Reports are in our investigation tells us that there may have been either surveillance footage or witnesses placing them to at Twisted Fisherman where he worked and then later at Duke's on water. How do we know that they were together that night? They met there. There are multiple surveillance cameras outside these restaurants, both of them, that show her arriving, walking through the east side of the restaurant. He arrived on the west side of the restaurant. There's such good video footage of this. This is just such a good, helpful part of the case. They go there together. He used to work there at the Twisted Fisherman. So the bartender there spoke with police and said, they came in, they sat at the bar together, they had a drink. It seemed friendly and casual. Nothing that would alert the bartender to anything that was wrong. He said they just 
had a few drinks and they left within an hour. They then, according to surveillance, leave together surveillance videos to the next place. Joining us an all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now. But to Miss Scarborough, this is Sade's mother. Miss Scarborough, when did you real I know that right now you're at your parents' home. I know that Sade, as you beautifully described it, had her own little bachelorette pad that she paid for from her two jobs. She's working while getting her college degree. Amazing. So when did somebody realize they needed to call you and ask, where's Sade? It wasn't until Wednesday, Nancy. Um, I, like, yeah, it was a whole 24 hours. I just had this feeling. Again, like we spent the last time I seen her was on that Sunday for Easter. Everything was good. It was a normal family visit. We all had a good interaction. Then Monday, she FaceTimed me that morning. Monday, she FaceTimed me. She was getting ready for work, and we had a good interaction. She's like, Mommy, like, you know, so I had some more, you know, like getting dressed. I was at my job. I went to work that morning. I got off as soon as I got home from work. Um, I was receiving calls from, like, my 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 mother and my brother. We were all concerned because we all have the 360 location app, Okay. We all share it as a family. So I have the app shared with me, my mom, both of my daughters. And then my daughter also shares Shade, my oldest daughter, also shares the app with additional friends and like other groups. But I have my own group with her, myself, my mother, and my youngest daughter. So we seen her like at this location Monday. Like again, Monday night, she I seen her getting, I mean, Monday morning, I seen her getting ready for work. She FaceTimed me. Then she, that evening around 3, 45, 4 o'clock, I got a text message from her asking a cash app for $15. My daughter does not ask me for money. Like she has, my daughter makes more money than me. Okay? Literally. She's, that was that boss. Okay. So like, what? I, it wasn't a big deal. I'm just that type of mom. You need something, I'm going to cash app it. It's very strange that she asked me for $15 at. You know what's very odd about that, Miss Scarborough? It reminds me of when Gabby Petito went missing and her family started getting texts that didn't sound like her. For instance, she wrote about her grandfather. She texted about her grandfather, but she called him by his full name. That would be like me uh, writing my producer right here, Jackie, and going, hi, Jackie, how's Jackie today? It just doesn't make any, it's just wrong. So you get this test asking for $15, and Sade would never have done that. Mm. I mean, if she needed, she could have charged Apple Pay, you name it. So you knew right then something was wrong, and then this. Take a listen to Chief Jeffrey Norman. On Saturday, April 6th, MPD continued the search of, in the area and located additional human remains on the railroad tracks. Later in the evening on Saturday, April 6, MPD returned to the area when Ms. Robinson's family located her blanket. At this time, detectives located additional human remains. According to court documents, the remains found Saturday included human flesh and a foot. The foot had pink nail polish, possibly matching the polish on the leg found days earlier. Another thing that really... Nancy, can I say something real briefly? Yes, please do. I just, I just, I just want to clarify that the community... I want to make this clear, okay? And I'm going to be holding all accountable that have been... I'm not blaming or attacking people. There have been detectives and sergeants that have been pulling up selectively on my team. There has been the community. There have been active members advocating for this case. I know it is affecting many, but there is some faulty things that have been being handled. OK, first of all, I want to correct all of the the chief executives that are pulling up from my county and my community that are not pronouncing my daughter's name correctly. Mm. I respectfully thank you, Nancy Grace and your team, the way you guys pulled up respectfully, asked me my name, asked me my daughter's name, and asked how to pronounce it. I respectfully thank you for that. I wanted to tell you that, first of all. 
and foremost, because a lot of these, a lot of people are pulling up and being disrespectful. And this is my own community, the mayor, the chief executive. They have not pulled up to my front porch. They have not told me they're sorry. They have not sent their condolences. They're on the news talking stuff. And the community are the members who found my daughter's remains and other items the second and third and the fourth time. If they, the police was not doing a job the first time correctly for the community to keep finding stuff and doing their own search parties because I'm too weak to go out there and search for my daughter. I'm sorry, Nancy. Let me pause it for a second. I, sorry, I had to keep getting up because my daughter, you know, you know, kids, she was hung, I had to make something and whatever. But I hope I didn't. I, well, I really want to hear that part where she was talking about the Life 360, but hopefully I covered that already. So I'm not really missing out on anything. Hopefully, you know, I, I'd still like to hear it from the mother, but. Um, I mean, this probable cause affidavit, it does show like they've did a lot. They did a lot. They did quite a bit of work, but I don't know that they could have done it without the, when you think about it, I mean, when you try to think about what, what the mother is saying, um, a lot of this information did come from the community finding body parts, which, you know, a lot of times you do need the help like of everybody, you know, but also like this whole timeline and location and GPS and blah, blah, blah. That's all because the family had this Life 360 app, which is I mean, it's it's really good that they did have that. You know, it's really unfortunate. Nobody knew how, how would anybody know that this psychopath is you know, going to kill her. Um, that night. Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. You're right. And I got to tell you something, Miss Scarborough. Guys, you are hearing Sade's mother. I always do that every case. And I did it with every case I ever investigated or prosecuted. And this is why this may mean something to you, Miss Scarborough. Because when my fiance was murdered at his funeral, it didn't make me angry or mad. But I remember in the middle of the funeral, I noticed it. The pastor kept referring to me as Mary throughout Keith's entire funeral over and over and over. I mean, I wasn't angry, but I, I remember it to this day. And it's just one of those things that just stick with you. I know you don't care what any of these politicians say, but for Pete's sake, at least get the name right. At least do that much. Guys, we're talking about it is so hard for everybody on this panel to talk about this with Sade's mom with us. But she says she wants justice and justice comes at a price. Let me tell you that. And that price is suffering and she is suffering right now. But I'm going to talk about these facts because these facts are or what I pray to God are going to put the son of a Milwaukee millionaire behind bars for life because I believe in DNA DNA. And, and I wonder if this guy's daddy is going to come and help him out, you know, with an attorney, with some funds, try to get a good attorney. But the, to me, it looks like they got a lot of evidence putting him in the spot video GPS video them together like him on the bus after cannot lie science cannot lie joe scott morgan we just heard very upsetting details about fingernail and toenail polish on the remains guys joseph scott morgan renowned professor of forensics jacksonville state university which has an incredible criminal justice program we've reenacted several crimes together he is a professor of forensics. He is the author of Blood Beneath My Feet on Amazon. And now he's the host of a hit series, Body Bags, with Joe Scott Morgan. Joe Scott, you know, we talk about DNA all the time, how you can match this and that, and every action has a reaction and leaves a trace. But when it comes down to human talk, like the color of Sade's toenail polish, matches the color of her fingernail polish. We're talking about a severed leg. And somebody at the medical examiners went, look, the polish matches. 
I don't need DNA. A jury's not going to need DNA, but they're going to have it. Why? Uh, because every contact, as you mentioned, does in fact leave a trace. We've known that for over 100 years now, and it's coming to fruition here in this in the world in which we inhabit. Uh, you know, you think about things like tool marks and all these other identifiers, fingerprints traditionally, but DNA is going to play a big role in this. And we're talking about proximity, Nancy, with the alleged perpetrator here. He will have had a very intimate contact, unfortunately, with Sade. My apologies, Mrs. Scarborough. I know that this is very painful, but there will have been an intimate contact on some level. Just this idea of dismemberment alone is going to yeah. leave a trace behind. And it's not necessarily his trace on her as much as it will be her trace on him potentially. And ultimately, it could be her, Sade, that actually brings him to justice. That's one redemptive point along this because her DNA will be found on him and it will be pointing a big accusing finger back at him. On Wednesday, April the 4th, our investigation led to a person of interest, Maxwell Stephen Anderson, who lives in the 3100 block of South 39th Street, where he was arrested after a traffic stop near the home, a search warrant was conducted. That search warrant unearthed evidence of blood in the home. Investigators reportedly found blood on a comforter and on the wall of a stairwell leading down to the basement. No details have Ooh. been released on who. And a wall of a stairwell leading down to the basement. So let's, let's take a look at the property a bit. Uh, Mo found the listing for me. So this, this listing, it's for a couple of addresses on that block. I, I guess all the houses have like the same layout, I guess. Um, so this is not the, like, this is not how his house is actually furnished, but you can kind of look at the, the layout. It's like a pretty big, spacious house for the most part. What I really wanted to get to is one of the bathrooms. When I get to uh, uh, this, this must be the attic, I guess. I think. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Huh. There's the basement. I don't, know if, I don't know if they showed the stairwell to the basement at all in this these pictures. No, I don't see any. Just a floor plan as well. I don't know. It might be one of the, the three bedroom, two bathrooms, maybe. 1,800 square feet. Milwaukee. Whose blood was recovered. You were just hearing the Milwaukee City Sheriff Danita Ball and Sydney Sumner crime online. Not only did blood evidence emerge in his home, this guy, oh. this idiot, technically. Mo says it's a duplex, so there's an entrance in the front, one entrance in the side, and another is either in the back or the garage slash house in the backyard. I'm going to look up the address myself, too. What I was wondering, too, was he living there alone? You know? 
for legal term, left a phone trail a mile wide. You know, when you look at his home, you think, wow, beautiful yard, immaculately kept. You know why? Not because of him. 33-year-old former high school football star, he's a nepo baby, nepotism baby. Mm. This 33-year-old guy, Maxwell Anderson, has a millionaire dad who wow. ran a Milwaukee insurance brokerage firm. Wow. Now, what do we know about him, Alexis Therese Chuck? He has a rap sheet. He has been arrested for domestic, I'm sorry, not just arrested, convicted for domestic oh. abuse, for wow. disorderly conduct, and for drunk driving. This guy has a rap sheet a mile long. He oh. is not an upstanding citizen of the community. And the, as I said, these are not just arrests we're waiting to hear from. He has been convicted of all three of these things. Did you just say he's not an upstanding member of the community? You know what? That is certainly putting perfume on the pig. Guys, listen to Sydney Sumner Crime Online following what Alexis has just told us. Growing up the son of a millionaire businessman, Maxwell Anderson was a Catholic school prep football star with a bright future. Anderson works for his millionaire dad's insurance companies with limited success. But when his father moves mm. to Florida, Anderson stays in Milwaukee working as a bartender. Oh, so dad lives in Florida. It's always Florida. Okay. And I think I think he was the only person in that house on record anyway. A former co-worker of Anderson, Samantha Brenner, describes Anderson as erratic, sometimes getting drunk while bartending at Victor's nightclub. Uh. A friend describes Anderson as childish and having quite the temper. Joining me right now is renowned forensic psychologist and mediator, Dr. John Delatore. Now, Delatore... <laughs> No offense to bartenders, my brilliant niece tended bar for a while uh, while she was in graduate school. Uh, long story short, what do you think this mom and dad are thinking about right now? They pump all this money, all this time into their son. It turns out to be a 33-year-old abuser of alcohol bully tending bar erratically when he shows up to work. Yeah, listen, they probably know who he is. And and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be real frank with you here, Nancy. This isn't the first person that he's done this to. Sade is not the first person. This, this, this is someone who has a long history. And I'm not surprised to hear about a rap sheet with disorderly conduct and, and domestic abuse. This is not someone who just one day decides that he's going to uh, stalk a 19-year-old and then dismember. This isn't someone that does that. This is someone who has been long planning and been engaging in problematic behaviors, escalating them each time so that eventually he's comfortable with actually doing the things that he's been fantasizing about. His parents parents knew who he was mm. and they tried and they did whatever it was that they tried and they did to get him to not do those things. But ultimately, he was going to do it anyway. Let's have a little reality check. Alexa says he's not an upstanding citizen. OK, um, Delatory, you're also airbrushing the truth. Let me talk about this guy. Police find a foot a pe uh, appear apparently human flesh at a playground, pink nail polish matching up. In the home, they find blood, gasoline containers, blood on a comforter, blood scattered throughout the home. Let me tell you this, and I'm going to go to you, Fattis, with me, high-profile trial lawyer, uh, TV legal analyst, founding partner of the Warner Fattis Elite Legal Group. Eric, I agree with Delatory. This isn't his first time mm -hmm. at the rodeo. You don't go from zero to 120 MPH in two seconds. There has to be something, some revving up up to not only a murder, but a luring, luring her onto a date. How many times do you think he watched her come in, have a drink, have dinner, anything like that, before he gets the guts up to say, hey, would you like to go to dinner? He planned this. 
You think you go from zero to murder and dismemberment in one night? Oh, I agree with Miss Scarborough. This is not his first time, and Delatory hit the nail on the head. What about it, Eric? Yeah, Nancy, it's chilling to think about what was going through Maxwell Anderson's mind, allegedly, as he appears to have been preparing for this. You know, the details give rise to a predatory nature here. There's a huge age gap, right? And, and then there's also a friend who says that Maxwell Anderson had a five foot by six foot deep hole dug in his backyard. And then we look at the rapidity, how, how quickly um, it the, the, this turning from a murder to dismemberment in, in, a, in like overnight. That's not something that just happens on a whim, in my personal opinion. That's something that was planned out and, and is just grotesque in terms of what we're learning. Anderson has his share of troubles with the law. He gets violent with family in Colorado, steals a family member's mm. car, crashes into a patio, breaks his collarbone, gets misdemeanor charges for that. While staying with a different relative, he refuses to clean up after himself. And when the relatives try to lay down the law, their ungrateful guest punches a hole in the wall and breaks their cell phone so they can't call police for help. Maxwell Anderson also has two DWIs in the last 10 years. Good gravy. Okay, Alexis Tereshuk. There's so much in this guy's criminal history. Of course, he is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the current case. You know, I'm looking at a photo of him holding onto a strap in a bus. Apparently, the Milwaukee Transit captured the face of the subject boarding and remaining on a bus. The booking photo seems to be the same guy wearing the exact clothing depicted on the subject who fled the scene of the car arson, including a large tan backpack with tan stripes. That goes to corroborate the gas cans found in his home. He is the guy, according to police, that burned Sade's car that she worked so hard to buy all on her own, holding down two jobs while going to college. There was an eyewitness to the burning of the car. As Sade's mother said, this community did everything. When it happened, he, the eyewitness said they saw a man in a jacket with a backpack close the door of this Honda and flick a lighter into the car and it burst into flames. And so the person started screaming, he did that, he did that, he did that. And he he ran away. That person contacted the police to tell them about being the actual eyewitness to him burning it. This was absolutely the community being on their high alert and really helping out here. The JW Marriott Miami Turnberry Resort and Spa offers Nancy Gray times at 4.31 a.m. The car leaves the park. Three hours later, bus surveillance catches a man carrying a tan backpack walking away from a fire at 30th and Lisbon. At 8.12 a.m., Anderson carrying a tan backpack is seen boarding a bus heading toward his home. Anderson gets off at 8.35 a.m. and enters his backyard eight minutes later. To Joseph Scott Morgan, professor of forensics, Jacksonville State. Joe Scott, what do you believe those tan backpacks are going to reveal? And how is the search of the backpacks? And I don't mean open the backpack and take everything out. I mean the forensic search of the backpacks. What is that search going to reveal? They're going to take that thing apart piece by piece, Nancy. And I can tell you down deep in those fibers, you're going to find DNA evidence. You'll be able to actually see perhaps uh, body fluids, and I'm talking about blood, just with the unaided eye, that might actually appear as they are actually taking this thing apart and looking at it. And they need to, and they need to take a look at all, I mean, all of his clothing in that house. I, you know, I got to join in in unison. I got to join Miss uh, Scarborough in unison on this, on this particular point. And you as well, Nancy. I think that this place should be locked down and every square inch of it has to be examined. I mean, gone through with a fine tooth comb because I don't think this is his first rodeo. Mm. You do not get to this level of violence. And I'm talking about post-mortem violence here. It just, just instantaneously, it doesn't happen like this. This almost seems practiced 
uh, in one level. You have to have the tools. You have to have the ability. Now, in that basement down there, that's going to be a treasure trove of biological evidence. My curiosity is piqued in the sense is, do we have any kind of layering of evidence there? Are there any other biological samples down there that are not necessarily belonging to those of Sade? Has, have any other potential victims been down there at any potential time? I think that that's very important here. Can I throw a scenario, jump on, jumping off what Joe Scott Morgan is saying to Eric Faddis? Everybody jump in, please. We need all of your brain power. Eric Faddis, think about it. You just told us that in the perp, the alleged perp's backyard, there was a grave dug. I mean, a full-on grave, five feet, I believe you said. What person does this? You have murdered a teen girl, and you dig a grave in the backyard, and then you think, oh, wait, you know what? Never mind. I'll just go through a very lengthy dismemberment, and then I'll scatter this little girl's remains all across Milwaukee, and hey, nobody will piece it together. Well, he was wrong. My point is... Okay, and pausing for a second, I think Biel found the link for me, because I heard, I heard multiple people talking about the sex dungeon thing, and I couldn't find it. That's what I was doing, actually, while I was kind of quietly listening and trying to search for it. So there's this article by Atlanta Blackstar, and she says if you scroll down, you'll find it. Okay. Robert, oh, so this is kind of interesting. You know, the leg was discovered. She didn't show up for work. She told the worker she was, uh, she told her a worker in her apartment that she was excited to, for the date. Robinson's mother, Sheena Scarborough, uh, told the news that Robinson texted her that day for $15, which she called very unusual. That's interesting. Scarborough feared the worst for her daughter when she last saw her on Easter Sunday. We know about that. Okay. Authorities confirmed a series of texts. They agreed to meet for dinner. Surveillance videos show the pair eating and drinking. The leg was found near Lake Michigan. Covered all that. Okay, okay. The gate ramming. Multiple, all this stuff we talked about, okay? Keep going. I just want to make sure we don't miss any kind of like interesting detail before we get to that dungeon thing. Court records show Anderson was a bartender, a Navy veteran, was arrested in three separate times, disorderly conduct between 2014 and 2019. He was recently arrested for operating a vehicle while impaired. Yet a woman who claims she knows Anderson told the news that he has a sex dungeon in the basement of his home. I got a little bit of a tour and he was like, do you want to see the basement? I was like, no, I'm okay. He's like, it's creepy down there. And I was like, no, it's okay. The young woman told the news reporters. The woman was also suspicious about a hole in his backyard that the local outlet confirmed was still on Anderson's property this week. Okay. Surveillance video from a home across the street revealed on and off movement in the backyard until around 12.45 a.m., April 2nd. Investigators also found blood on a comforter and gasoline containers in his home. In addition to the pizza joint job she had, Robinson had another job, was enrolled at Milwaukee Area Technical College studying for criminal justice, okay, and was preparing to join the Air Force. Okay, that we know. Wow. So this woman here saying this guy had a sex dungeon down there in that basement. I had a friend that told me, see, see, I, 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 I don't know if this guy, like, I wonder, like, did he do that testing and, and hoping? Oh, thanks, Natalie, too. Sent me a, a thing for that. I wonder if he did that. I wonder if these creeps do these little subtle things 
to test the waters and see if like how the person reacts and see if it's like acceptable. Like, oh, I have it. What do you say? What do you say? I got a, I got a dungeon downstairs. Told that he has a sex dungeon. I got a little bit of a tour and he was like, do you want to see the basement? I was like, no, he said it's creepy down there. But what I'm wondering is. He's a Milwaukee bartender. Are later on April. And what sources are telling us investigators found Anderson appearing in search news has confirmed the 33 year old man has ties after an works full identified out of fear for her safety Ooh. nightclub on the east side. A woman who claims she met Anderson there spoke to 12 News by phone, but asked not to be identified out of fear for her safety. She says he once invited her to his south side home. I remember there being something about a hole in the yard, um, and this was back in fall. I remember asking about it, and he was like, oh, my God. Bro. Yo, that shit is huge. So, so did he cover this hole up? Because these pictures that people posted on Facebook, it looks like he, clo like he closed it up. Right? Oh, maybe we just can't see the other side of this. Maybe there's another angle to this. Because in this thing flying over, that shit, that shit looks... It looks like a big-ass hole in the ground. That you can climb inside. When building a garden. In a view from News Chopper 12. Alright, that looks like a hole there, actually. Yeah. A gaping hole next to Anderson's house was visible earlier this week. Inside the home? And when I got in... It just kind of seemed like he was in the middle of a whole bunch of renovations, but kind of seemed like the kind of guy that never would finish them. Thursday, 12 News learned from multiple law enforcement sources, Anderson had what is described as a sex dungeon in his basement. Wow. So I got a little bit of a tour, and he was like, do you want to see the basement? And I was like, no, I'm okay. He's like, it's creepy down there. And I was like, no, that's okay. Now, Hannah, Anderson hasn't been charged, but is still being held after... She might have been a victim had she gone downstairs. And I had a friend tell me this story one time about a friend that they had. And like, they're they just friends, you know? And like, sometimes this person would go over to this person's house, hang out, whatever. And she told me one time she went in his bathroom and this guy had like toys all over the place. Like ab abnormally, um, an abnormal amount of toys and just like stuck to the wall and shit, like on some ditty shit. As if it's just just regular shit. You have company over. You just got all these toys all over the place. And that's what I'm like. I don't know if these people do that weirdo shit to kind of like test the waters and see people's reaction. You know, I don't, I don't know. After almost a week in jail. Right, Joy. So the court did give prosecutors an additional 72 hours to either charge Anderson or release him. Those 72 hours run out tomorrow morning. We will, of course, be sure to stay on top of any developments and bring them to you as they happen on air and online. Hannah Hilliard live in Milwaukee. Wow. OK, so there's there's some validity to that, to the whole this whole sex dungeon thing at the bottom of the house. That's crazy. Okay. Eric Faddis, was that grave for somebody else? What else is in that backyard or in his childhood home backyard? I mean, what has this guy been up to? Yeah, I mean, that's the alarming prospect here is, is for whom was he digging this five foot by six foot grave in his own backyard? You know, um, his friends were talked to and a lot of them said that they, he had a creepy, weird vibe. He had erratic behavior. He may have had an alcohol issue. And then we look at, um, you know, there are gas canisters found in his home. Um, this quickly turns from date to homicide, to dismemberment, to scattering human remains all across Milwaukee. It's just not something that happens on spur of the moment, Nancy. Family and friends of Sade Robinson are still looking for her remains. Why no video of Nancy? Because um, she drops her audio podcast version first, and then she drops it on YouTube, the video version. So I haven't seen the video version out yet. She just, uh, she dropped the teaser of the, the little conversation with her and the mother, but she actually hasn't dropped this podcast on YouTube yet, so there's only the audio version now.
Baines. Basing their searches where Robinson's phone pinged, volunteers canvassed the bluffs and beach near Warnemont Park. There have been no reports of law enforcement searching the area of Kern and Pleasant Valley Park, where Robinson's phone pinged mm. before it traveled south to Warnemont. Both Kern and that's the thing, too. We were talking about that earlier when we were checking out the locations about this Kern area, Kern Park. Like, what was he doing up here? They, this lady just said that the police haven't checked that area out. Because I'm wondering if he just, dis, you know, discarded evidence. I, I think burning the car was to try to dis burn evidence, too, and that he, he was in the car. Maybe he was hoping to burn that kind of evidence and whatever else was in there. What's interesting, too, is that and maybe I think it's on the affidavit is that he didn't try to turn off a phone. He didn't try to discard the phone. The phone was found in the vehicle. Um, so I, I wonder did she have the phone on her? Like in her pocket when she walked into the apartment or did she leave her phone in the car? I don't know. And he didn't know where it was at or something. I, I don't know. Why, why not? The guy wasn't thinking. I wonder where they found the phone. It seemed because she's dismembered and they find the phone in the car. Why? Like, where was the phone at? And Pleasant Valley have access to the Milwaukee River, where Anderson could have scattered more remains. The family says they will not stop searching until Robinson is found and can be properly laid to rest. To Dr. John Delatore joining us, um, renowned psychologist and mediator. Dr. Delatore, I, I don't get it. A guy that's born with a silver spoon in his mouth, uh, sent to a, a fancy Catholic school, football star in high school. You know those people that their glory days were when they were in the ninth grade? Um, that's him. Then his dad gives him a job through nepotism within the insurance company, the insurance brokerage company that the dad owns. That didn't last long. Then he wanders around and ends up bartending after several, let me say, brushes with the law. That whole place, his whole house needs to be taken apart the way Rex Huerman's home was, the Long Island serial killer suspect and searched because I'm not completely convinced that that grave he dug in the backyard was meant for this teen mm. girl, this beautiful teen girl, Sade Robinson. So what else will we learn? So my question to you, Dr. Sunday, Dr. Dr. is no, how do you go from a silver spoon in your mouth to three hots and a cot and an orange jumpsuit? It takes a long time. Again, this isn't someone, people don't just snap. Right. That's a complete misnomer. People don't snap. This is years of him building up to get to this point. Now, he's explored other ways in which he's going to be engaging in violent acts, whether it's using alcohol or whether it's uh, domestic violence, intimate partner violence. Right. But it's not just this house. It's it's any place where the family used to live or property that the family would own, anything that he had access to. This is someone who wants to be comfortable when he's engaging in these violent acts, using the properties that he already knows provides that sense of comfort. And then he likes to flash it. As we see, this isn't just disposing of body parts. He's putting it out in places for people to see, for people to get scared. This is someone who wants to be known mm. for engaging in these kinds of violent acts. Miss Garbra, you. That guy makes a good point. I hope, I don't know what's going to reset. I have it. not okay. even been able to have a funeral for Sade yet. Is that correct? Why? Yes, that's correct, Nancy. Um, this is probably the hardest part that we're struggling with right now. Um, trying to find peace, lay my daughter to rest, get solace. Um, just give her her transition that she deserves because she was taken too soon. My baby was only, she didn't even make 20. She was 20 in a few weeks on May the 10th, Nancy. They don't, they can't even provide us with a death certificate right now. They don't even uh, know the cause of my daughter's death. They don't know when. Like, they not giving me enough information, Nancy. This is so frustrating. There is no closure right now for me and my family. And everybody have to plan things. But I will be having a, a community gathering this Friday. And I will be letting the community know where, what time in the, the place and event it will be at in Milwaukee um, just to 
we'll have a candlelight balloon release. Um, I cannot even plan a memorial for my daughter right now. Also, I want everybody to know that there will be a fundraiser for Sade's funeral. Go to Justice for Sade, and that is spelled S-A-D-E, like you would say Said, like Sage. It's pronounced Sade, Justice for Sade, our fallen angel. Miss Garber, before we sign off, I just want you to know how much we are praying for you and thinking about you and your whole family. And we will not rest until her killer gets the maximum sentence in that jurisdiction, which is no life without parole. Yeah, no death penalty God, out please there. Please be with Sade's family. Nancy, thank you. Thank you. This is Sade right here. These are her earrings that came in the mail yesterday, Nancy. I don't know if you can see them. I had to go to my baby's place for the first time. And um, these came for her. These are her earrings. And I have her earrings on. These are my baby's earrings. Like, this is so traumatic. You know what's so funny? Look what I've got. My dad's shirt. My dad that passed away. I don't know why. I just feel better having it with me. Like your earrings. Guys, Let's just stop for one moment and remember an American hero, police officer Michael Jensen, just 29 years old. Jensen shot in the line of duty Syracuse, New York, leaving behind his loving parents and sweet sister. American hero, police officer Michael Jensen. I want to thank all of our guests for being with us, specifically Sade's mother, Miss Scarborough, who suffered greatly to get Sade's story out, and to all our other guests, but especially to you for being with us tonight and every night. Nancy Grace signing off. Good night, friend. Okay, so I don't know when she's dropping that video episode. Maybe later today or tomorrow. So you can check out Nancy Grace's article. It says, gunman used cocaine before killing deputy and officer with 40-round assault rifle. There's a whole press conference and everything on it. The body of Lieutenant Deputy Michael Hussock right. escorted from the county medical examiner's office to a funeral home before being taken to his final resting place. Just one of several powerful tributes taking place Wow. Um, hmm. like there's, uh, we could still keep going. So Maxwell Anderson had a big hole in his backyard. That aerial view was crazy to see that. Um, close friend described him as a weird vibe. You can see more photo of Anderson here, but his Facebook is taken down. The close friend of Anderson's, which is verified by pictures. He went over to Anderson's house roughly in June 2023, and I saw this massive hole in the side of his house. He said he told Anderson you should cover that up because he was worried Anderson's dog would fall in. He said he was building this underground basement. He told Heavy he requested that his name not be printed because he was afraid. Heavy knows his identity. He described the hole as probably five foot long and six feet foot deep and he said he saw it with his own eyes the man scribbled out a diagram for heavy to you sorry for heavy of where he saw the hole we already saw the picture and we saw the, the helicopter overview he said he didn't understand why anderson was building an underground basement when he had a big basement anyway in his house there's a gateway sorry there's a gate you take two steps forward and it's on the left side he was building it on the left side to the left of the concrete walkway. Oh, wait. He was building on the left side. To the left of the concrete walkway. So I'm wondering, have we not even maybe seen the other side? I'm wondering, is he talking about this pile of whatever here? 
Oh, yeah, that would be, no, that would be the right. I guess it depends where you're looking at it from. Or I'm wondering, is there something else on this side of the house? I think they're talking about this side, right? The, this part here, this, we can see. He described Anderson as a very chillish, but added he did have anger management temper thing. Like he would flip out over simple things. He believes Anderson no longer worked at the rave, but was bartending at Victor's nightclub more recently. So he's in this club working there. He could probably pick up woman from that place, just like the other person that gave the account of the basement. That woman that gave the account of the basement, though, she said sex dungeon, that, that that's what was down there. But she said that she told him no she didn't want to go down there so how did she know there was a sex dungeon down there you know all she said was that the guy said it was creepy he gives off a weird vibe the man said you feel uneasy around him at first i didn't like him i got a creepy weirdo type of vibe the journal sentinel confirmed with victors that anderson worked there part-time quoting the manager as expressing shock and saying that anderson was well liked a good worker he said Anderson was struggling with sleep and also had a hobby of shooting air pistols and liked anime. The man said he was shocked by the news. I started shaking, he said, but he added, I couldn't imagine him going this far. Heavy sources say Anderson is considered a person of interest, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Okay. Um, the one of the points on the podcast that they made that was really interesting too was that I almost wonder if he he did want people to find these body parts if he wanted to shock people because the foot being found close to where the car is at like why would he just discard the foot randomly it wasn't found like right next to the car I think it was found close to the car why discard the foot like that out there and even the by the Lake Michigan, he chucked it down the he went to this pump thing and discarded it down the bluff. I guess this is the bluff right here, probably. Like if he really was trying to throw it in the water, he wouldn't really try to throw it in the water. But he threw it in a place where like I mean, I don't know if people walk down this thing or not, because it does look like there's bluffs here. I don't know if people walk there or not. Clearly, somebody saw it. But, like, I mean, you could be walking with your family and kids, and you just see a leg. And with today's updates, where there's more body parts found, which, which, uh, I had the link. Not there. We type in her name again Shaw Day. There's a nice link that uh had the updates about the here it is the I think about the body parts here it is because now they found I think a torso more remains found believed to belong to Shade Robinson. Several more remains believed to belong to the homicide victim Sade were discovered along the shores of Lake Michigan Thursday along the Milwaukee, sorry, according to Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office. After 7.30 a.m. Thursday, a person today, literally, a person walking along the remote tree-lined stretch of beach in South Milwaukee discovered an arm and a torso. I mean, he really made it like a, an effort kind of to kind of just chuck it on the beach. I don't think he threw it in the water and washed up. I guess he just threw it on the beach side. The Panga brought down a resident of the nearby Lake Bluffs apartments, woke up an hour later. Her backyard overlooks the beach and she watched officers carry a body bag down to the cliff toward the lake. I used to walk down there all the time. And to know while standing outside her apartment, I don't want to go down there anymore. I don't want to be the one who finds what they found. I mean, imagine you taking your kids 
out there. Sade's workplace, Pizza Shuttle. The car was burned here. And more human remains. And then also more human remains here by the car. And then the legs found down here. And then further, further down, more remains. Um, with this part, I think we can, we can try to wrap this up. Let me see. We got a more pages. This is the discovery of human remains near 31st and Galena Street. I don't know if we need to read this whole thing, but check this out, though. So April 6th, Saturday, members of Milwaukee Police Department began to canvas the area near where Robinson's Honda Civic was set on fire while searching the area of 31st and Galena Playground. I don't know if that's actually a playground or if it's just called Galena Playground, the street. I don't know. Maybe somebody out there can tell me. Is that a thing? Let's see. Let me look that up over there. That'd be some sick shit if you left this at a playground. I mean, can I add destination? Let's let's see if that's an actual like playground or it's just the name of the street, Galena. Mm. Okay, I think it's actually just the name of the street. Okay, I was gonna say I thought he left that shit at, at a playground. All right. Um, they canvassed, okay, Milwaukee Police Department Cassandra Linder located a human foot in a wooded area adjacent to the train tracks that border the playground, sound like a playground, that border the playground to the east, investigators located. In addition to the foot, another piece of what appeared to be human flesh in the same area. Complainant has observed the recovered foot as well as the leg recovered in Warmont Park and observed they appear to be from the same individual, particularly due to the skin tone, size, and having matching pink nail polish. The location of where the remains were discovered was approximately one block south of Robinson's, where Robinson's car was set on fire. So members of the, the police department attempted to locate video footage regarding either disposal of human remains or footage related to the arson of Robinson's car. Detective Ryan obtained video from the Milwaukee County Transit System bus traveling westbound on Libsbun Avenue, MCTS Route 57. The video footage depicts the following. The bus stops on the corner of 29th and Libsbun Avenue at 729 a.m., facing westbound in the direction where Robinson's car was set on fire. Two subjects can be seen walking westbound on the north side of Libsbun Avenue, passing Libsbun Liquor and Food Mart. One of these subjects is wearing a blue coat, and the other subject is holding a black and white umbrella. The bus begins to drive forward towards 30th Street, at which time the person in the blue coat appears to be checking something out to the north, at which time a different subject can be seen walking through the glass lot towards Lipson Avenue. The subject is walking away from a fire that is beginning to burn in the parking lot slab behind the building at the corner of 30th and Lipson. As the trans as the transit bus passes the person walking away from the fire, you can see this individual appears to be a white male and is wearing dark pants, dark gray hooded top, carrying a tan colored backpack with tan straps that appears to be full. The bus, as the bus continues to pass, the subject with tan backpack can be seen starting to cross Lipson Avenue southbound. Milwaukee Police Detective Andrew Marks recovered video footage from Lipson Liquor and Food Mart, the footage, the footage depicts the subject in the blue jacket and the subject with the umbrella walking westbound on Lipson Avenue. Upon reaching the vacant lot next to the liquor store, both subjects appear to slow down, at which time the with the tan backpack begins to walk across Lipson on southbound and 30th Street. Backpack as he walks away. Oh, I skipped the line. The person in the blue jacket then appears to be in shock and begins pointing at the person in the tan backpack as he walks away. 
Then the subject in the blue jacket. Sorry, the subject in the blue jacket then tries to flag down cars by and can be heard on video yelling, he did that, while pointing across the street to the person with the tan backpack. The subject in the blue jacket also begins yelling for someone to call the fire department. So this guy, if I'm interpreting this right, this dude lights a car on fire and somebody sees this person light the car on fire and starts walking away. This person, I wonder if this person in the blue jacket, is that, is that Anderson? Or is that two witnesses? Because I, 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 cause I'm like, did Anderson light the car on fire? And then somebody scream at him, hey, he did that. And he turns around and like, yeah, call the fire department. Investigators were eventually able to identify the subject in the blue jacket as LAD. Uh, Detective Vincent Lopez and Detective Thaddeus Schmills interviewed LAD. Okay, so it's somebody else. It's not the perp. It's not Anderson. Who stated the following. LAD was walking down Lipson Avenue with her friend. Okay, friends. And saw the white male exit the driver door of Robinson's Honda Civic. She then observed the white male light a lighter and toss it into the driver's door window of the Honda. They began walking in LAD's direction. And last saw this white male walking westbound on Walnut Street from 30th, uh, from 30th Street. So there, there's, like I said, there's so much on this guy. Video, GPS, multiple uh, witnesses. I mean, he, he didn't do, and, you know, thank God he didn't do a good job of covering his, his tracks. But makes you wonder what's going on through this guy's head. Detectives then saturated the area to recover any surveillance footage. That would capture where the subject with the tan backpack walked towards after setting Robinson's car on fire. Through that video, Canvas detectives learned that the subject with the tan backpack walked westbound towards North 35th Street and then eventually got into the Milwaukee County Transit System bus at 8.12 a.m. to head southbound on North 35th Street. So, I mean, to me, it seems like the cops put in some work. You know, I mean, they, they did a lot of tracking and getting video and surveillance. The video that MCTS, I mean, this has been, what, what did they arrest this guy? Did they arrest him pretty soon after, didn't they? Um, okay. Then eventually got onto the bus at 8, 12 a.m. to head southbound on North 35th Street, which is the direction towards the defendant's house. The video from the MCT bus captured the face of this idiot as he boarded and remained on the bus and through that footage, complainant has reviewed the defendant's booking photo re related to his arrest on April 4th. Described below, complainant is able to identify that the subject as the defendant Maxwell. Same person. The defendant was wearing the exact clothing depicted on the subject fleeing the scene of the vehicle arson, including the tan backpack with tan straps, a depiction of the defendant's booking photo with the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office and the defendant on the MCTS bus depicted below. So here's the tan backpack. Nika, maybe he wanted to try something new, bored. I think some of the people are bored. I mean, I don't know. His father was rich, I guess. I don't, I don't know if he just, I don't know if the father gave him hand downs, gave him money. Ryan Bergman reviewed the MCTS video showing the defendant on the bus. The defendant boards the bus and pays his bus fare in cash. He then rides the bus south on 35th Street and gets off the bus at approximately 8.35 a.m. near South 35th Street and Lakefield Drive on Milwaukee's south side. It should be noted that there is not a bus stop at his location, and the defendant asked the bus driver to let him off there. He then departs the bus and begins to walk northbound. It should be further noted it is approximately an eight-minute walk from that location to the defendant's residence. And this would be the most logical place to depart the bus to walk home. Complainant reviewed surveillance video affixed to the residence across the street from the defendant, which was recovered by Milwaukee Police Department, Rachel Smith. The footage, the, the footage depicts South 39th Street and the front of the defendant's residence, as well as part of, as well as part of the south side of his residence. 
there is a front gate on the south side of the residence, and over that uh, gate, the rear gate near the alley is also visible. The defendant can be seen arriving through his back gate that is accessible through the alley behind the house at 8.43 a.m. So maybe he thought he was being sneaky going through the back. I don't know if that's how he, how he always walks in, but the arrival at this time is consistent with him walking, having walked to that location from the departing the bus. Complaint notes that the defendant's dark hooded top and tan backpack that appears full are visible in his video. What do you have in there? Complaint knows that Robinson's vehicle was ultimately towed from the location where the defendant set it on fire and it was searched. Okay, so they sent it to the crime lab. During the search of the vehicle located in the trunk was clothing that Robinson was wearing the evening of April 1st, namely the black puffer coat, light blue ripped jeans, and white shoes. So he took off her clothes, I guess? Along with the dark grayish brown purse, these items were found in the trunk of the vehicle and were partially fire damaged, although undamaged enough to identify them as the items Robinson was wearing. Also, was recovered a remnant of an iPhone consistent with the type of iPhone Robinson was known to have. Detective Rachel Smith reviewed additional surveillance video footage from the residents across the street. Her review of that footage revealed that the, the following. At around 9.24 p.m. on April 1st, there is motion near the back gate of the defendant's property, which appears to swing open, and the shadows consistent of two human figures enter the backyard. So they came through the back. Sade and uh, um, this guy. So they enter the backyard of the residence at 9.26 p.m. The living room light in the front of the defendant's residence, the upper unit, turns on. This would be consistent with the time that Robinson's phone appears to have arrived at the defendant's residence, as described above, and would be consistent with Robinson and Anderson arriving at the residence together. At 11.25 p.m., there is human movement in the backyard again. This movement continues on and off until approximately 1245. So what was he doing in that backyard? So from 1125, over an hour, just going in and out of the backyard, in and out of the backyard. Maybe he's going to the car. Maybe he's going, I don't know. This is consistent with the time that Robinson's phone appears to depart from Anderson's residence and begins to travel. Oh, maybe he's moving the part, the body parts in the car. And begins to travel around the city of Milwaukee before eventually ending up apparently stationary at Wanama Park, where the severed leg was discovered. As described above, Robinson's phone does not appear to depart from Anderson's residence between the, between the arrival around 9.24 p.m. on April 1st until around 12.50 a.m. on April 2nd. Smith also recovered surveillance video from this address, street that depicts the alley. This video does not depict defendant's residence, but it depicts the alley that connects to the defendant's residence. Smith wrote the video, which shows Robinson's vehicle leaving the alley around 12.47 p.m. on April 2nd. Smith also recorded video footage from a camera that depicts the intersection of South 35th Street and West Greenfield Avenue, which is to the north of the defendant's residence. The video depicts Robinson's vehicle heading northbound on 35th Street. Approximately 12.53 a.m. on April 2nd. This movement is consistent with the location of Robinson's phone as described. Okay. So. Okay. On, on April 4th at 1.16 a.m., Joseph Blanchard and John Gilliat conducted a traffic stop of a black Hyundai Santa Fe, which listed the Department of Transportation records to the defendant. So he gets stopped near South 38th Street and West Lakefield Drive, just a few blocks from his residence. The defendant was arrested at the time. A search of the defendant's vehicle led to the recovery of a zip-up hooded coat, zip-up hooded coat that appears to be the same coat the defendant is wearing in the still frame depicted above. So at this, on the bus, I guess. Complaint further states, based on preliminary analysis done by the criminal state crime lab, 
the pseudo standard for Sade C. Robinson was compared to a blood standard from a, the human leg recovered, and DNA analysis supports the preliminary conclusion that the leg belongs to Sade. Okay. Um, okay. And a complaint. So, it's a lot. I was arrested. So, Maxwell Anderson, his father, who has worked as a bartender. Sorry, Maxwell. What am I? Let me read this again. I think I've gone on too long. Maxwell Anderson, who has worked as a bartender and his father's insurance enterprise, wrote that he has that he was previously in the U.S. Navy. Father's insurance agency. Was Maxwell Anderson having worked there as a manager, and it, that didn't work out. Anderson's father, Stephen Anderson, is president of a major insurance agency company firm. Insurance Associates of America currently has 190 members in 32 states, writing business in 49 states. People have filled the comment thread of the Wakusha County Crime and Community Information Facebook page with information about Anderson since heavy story was shared there. He graduated from Pewaukee High School. He was in my brother's grade, and he was definitely in the circle of friends I had, which is creepy and just shocking, wrote one woman. Another woman wrote, I hung out with him in high school and briefly dated him. He was definitely different, and I can attest to the anger issues being true as well. His Facebook page describes him as single. His top visible post from April 4th at 10.05 a.m., when he shared a post about volunteering for Feeding America. Ama amazing. V made a post about volunteering for uh, Feeding America. Is that like a homeless thing? On April 8th, he wrote, anyone want to join me? He's probably hoping he could pick a woman up. He also posted a picture of his basement, his dogs out with his friends, and occasionally waiting on politics. So how did he post posted a picture of his basement? I thought it was a dungeon down there. Did he post the old picture or what? On November 18, he shared a graphic that read, every single person who confuses correlation and causation ends up dying. In September, he wrote with a spelling error, that can't seriously be giving, they can't seriously be giving us Biden versus Trump again. Neither should be eligible. <laughs> On February 20, 23, he wrote, I want an open bar at my funeral. In January 2023, he wrote, sorry, he opined, opined, ah, good old January rains, no climate change here. In 2019, he wrote that he was in a relationship. In 2016, he wrote, who will I be kissing on New Year's? The floor when I pass the F out. And then he has a supposedly a history of DV. 2019, he was convicted of disorderly conduct. He was convicted in Door County of disorderly conduct, domestic abuse, criminal damage to property, and intimidating, intimidating a witness in 2015. 2014 was convicted of disorderly conduct. In this county, court records show that the case was charged as disorderly conduct, domestic abuse, but it was pleaded down to disorderly conduct without modifier. According to the Journal Sentinel, in one instance, Anderson was accused of shoving a woman, smashing a cell phone, and breaking things in the kitchen. In the Door County case, the newspaper reported that Anderson was accused after a relative suggested he seek out mental health treatment, and Anderson smashed a glass, punched a hole in the wall, and grabbed the phone out of the hand of another relative who was trying to call police. So this guy's wild. This guy's a lunatic. In the 2019 case, he was accused of beating a stranger, according to the Journal Sentinel. Wow. Okay, and we covered this. Her um, wanted to join the Air Force. Really sad. Crazy. Wild. One date. Their first date together. One date. Jeez. What's up, Kick Rocks? 
All right. Well, I guess I mean we covered that pretty in depth. I think if there's any updates, I'll definitely follow up with that. Um, the next trial we're gonna do is Karen Reed, and that is not happening. It's they're doing they're doing jury selection right now, and from what I heard, um, I should delete the. Oh, here it is. They're still doing jury selection. It's going to go into Monday. So Monday, Karen Reed opening day will not be Monday morning. So it could be Monday afternoon or Tuesday will start the trial. Saturday, we're watching the fight on Discord. Really excited about that. And um, chases right now are slow. There's been a bunch of like activity, but nothing pans out to like a live feed live stream so right now it's like a dry spell we'll see when that picks up again and uh shelly ray says go to wisn 12 follow release a statement i did read the statement i'll look it up he just basically gave his condolences they like they apologize and give their condolences from what i saw i'll take a look at it this is the family go fund me. I put it in the description of the video. Let's see. Sade. Father of accused killer speaks out. On, my behalf, on behalf of myself and my family, I would like to express our deepest sympathy and heartfelt condolences to the family and loved ones of Sade Robinson. We are shocked and devastated by her senseless death. To Sade's mother and father, words cannot express our sorrow for the incomprehensible pain and grief you are going through. We join the entire community in celebrating Sade's life. To the media, please allow us privacy during this time as we process this terrible tragedy. The Anderson family. That was, that was their statement. And if you guys can help me out with the like button as well, please help out with the like button. I'd appreciate that. And subscribe. Subscribe to Ick and Mel, but also subscribe to um, subscribe to Ick and Mel CC. I'm trying to get to 10,000 subs. Sorry, 20,000 subs on Ick and Mel CC. So it's Ick and Mel space CC. We're currently, how many are we away? How many are we? Also, Melissa Melly's. I saw you left me a membership chat thank you for your membership 22 months it says whoop whoop pull over thank you melissa Mel melly's and donnie thank you for the super chat uh let me check the second page here real quick we're 80 away maybe i have to make a post maybe i need to make a post on youtube and um twitter to get those 80 subscribers um for the members we had a good live stream this morning. It was kind of fun. We covered a lot of different stories, crazy shit. We were on for like two hours. So for the members, make sure, because some people aren't getting my notifications, make sure you go to my front page on YouTube, whether it's on the phone or computer. Just go to the front page, scroll down, and it says members only videos. Oh, I didn't add to the playlist. I got to add it to the playlist. That's weird, too. It should automatically, but it's not. Okay. All right. There's a problem right there. Let me fix that. So I got to add it. The other thing, what I am going to do too, members only videos. I'm going to make a new members playlist. We have this one. That's the members only videos. But I'm going to make a second one with like the best member videos. Where's it at? Members only. So it, it added here. There was even a furry story. These kids going to school dressed up as furries. Nurses that kill. Meth mother admits to killing her child and she gets off. We covered a bunch of stories earlier today. So check that out. But I'm going to make a new playlist that has like the best ones that people love. Like Ask My Girlfriend About Me, my LSD story, Deal With The Devil. I have a, quite a few crazy stories that I'll, I'll make an easy playlist that's uh, the good ones are easier to find. All right. 
BL, thank you for the 28 months. Says, Thanks everyone for showing Mel amazing support. Please sub up to the second channel and join Discord. 28 months! It's scary dating, huh? You gotta do, nowadays, you gotta do background checks. All kinds of stuff. Background checks and like, I mean, she already, they already had a lot of the right stuff, you know, like the location on and all this stuff. He, he must have caught Shade like off guard. He must have, I, I think he must have like, he must have like, I don't know, he's a coward. So he, he must have did some sneak shit, especially that they were talking about the blood on the way to the basement. You know, I, I don't know. It, Wow. Yo, Melly Mel's, thank you so much. 20 memberships dropped. Holy moly. Yo, for the new members, remember what I said, go check out the front the front page. Check out the playlist. If you're bored one day, check out the members' videos. And there's some really good ones on there if you want to check them out. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. P. Baker Brunswick, thank you for the membership as well. You know, I, I've had like some interesting first dates. <laughs> um, yeah, I in recent time I've had some interesting first dates, but I, I, I'm usually the I believe it or not, I'm usually the one that's like more paranoid. Than the woman, the woman, and and I think it's because at that point they know what I do, and so I I think they feel they can trust me or something. I guess I don't know. They think I guess because I'm a YouTuber or something, or maybe because they've been watching me, so they feel. But for me, it's like I'm just paranoid. So, I've had some interesting first dates or first meetings that I I probably won't even mention. Uh, yeah, most of don't do it. I was like, yeah, I, probably best I don't. I don't mention. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was one uh, first time meeting somebody. I know, true. That uh, and they came in from another state. That like, I was su I was super paranoid. The girl didn't even want to talk on the phone. She just wanted to text, and I'm like. I want to hear your voice. I want to know that it's, it's actually you. And this person was kind of reluctant, but we got on the phone and then I drove out there, but I got so paranoid. It was like a 40 minute drive. I literally turned around and went back home. I said, fuck this person. <laughs> and then the next day, like we started texting again and I, I went up there again. I literally was on the phone with my boy on speakerphone. And I pulled up on this chick and I rolled my windows down and I was like, all right, okay. It's the, it's, it is who they say they are, blah, blah, blah. They're like, you sure you're good? I was like, yeah, like I literally, and I'm the guy doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. It's crazy. It's crazy. It is crazy dating now and everything's online and everything's, you know, People can give you a fake name. So, like, who knows? You know, somebody tells you this is what my name is. You don't even know if that's really their name. So, even if you do a background check, you know, is that really who you're looking up type of shit? There's a lot of crazy, risky shit going on. Um, On the members live today, I, I covered a bunch of stuff. I, I covered, um, I don't know if you heard of that story of that person that was scammed. I might clip some of the stuff and post it on Twitter or Facebook. There was this person, these two, let me see, scammer gets. I'll just show this real quick and then we'll, we'll call it. But this this was this was so fucking crazy, man. Crazy. All kinds of crazy shit going on out there, man. Like seriously, be careful, be cautious, be paranoid. You know, like video will stop you in your tracks. And I'm gonna warn you, it is difficult to both watch and to hear. Sheriff deputies in Western Ohio believe it shows two people ensnared by a scammer who orchestrated a deadly meetup via their phones last month. 
Dash cam video shows 81-year-old William Brock pointing a gun at 61-year-old Lolita Hall as she tries to escape. Investigators say Brock had been on the phone with the scammer who tried to extort him and threatened his family when Hall pulled up. Brock thought Hall was in on the scam, but police say that she had no idea about it. They say she was scammed into going there to pick up a package. In the dash cam video, you can hear Hall plead for her life before Brock shot her. So I'll leave it at that. I won't play the whole thing, but it, it was really, really, really messed up. So the scammer was scamming this elderly guy the whole time. And the scammer brought in this person. Her name is Hall, I guess her last name, and ha had sent her because on Uber, you can send people to go pick up something. So that scammer had just sent somebody to pick up a package. She was randomly selected, just randomly. There's no like you can't pick who delivers your package. So she's randomly selected in the app. And she goes to this guy's house. This guy, I guess, started picking up on that as being scammed. And he thought that this one was a part of the scam. So he shoots her. And she's saying, please stop. Please stop. I'm, I'll call 911. He shoots her, like, in the leg. They come around the car one more time. And he's still, like, after her. And sh shoots her, like, two other times. Now he's pleading not guilty. And he's claiming that, well, his side of the thing is claiming that the person, before she showed up, the person called him on the phone and was threatening him. And so I, he's trying to claim that he thought that was the person that showed up. He's pleading not guilty. It's a whole freaking mess. That's what I'm saying. Just be careful, man, because this shit is just nuts. People doing all kinds of shit out there, man. Charisma, thank you for the super chat. Says my mom got taken for 60k in that scam. Holy crap! Melissa Mellies, thank you so much again. You know, appreciate that. And Wendy Hamilton, thank you as well, because you're always supporting. And Mustard Mama, if you're out there, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna call it for now. I'm gonna probably chill for the rest of the night unless we get something that pops up like uh, urgent. Um, there is some Sebastian Rogers mess. Maybe we'll cover at some point. I don't know. And I gotta I gotta fix all the settings for Streamlabs. And yeah, just do a couple of things. So thank you guys so much. Thank you for all the members. And just be careful. Be safe. Have a good night. Love you guys. Bye. Boop, boop, boop. Boop, boop, boop. She got it. Kelly says she got a call from the same person and told her she was going to pick up some money from him. They set these two up and made this happen. Yeah, they should find that person. That per one of the phones tracked to Canada. But it turned out to be a burner phone, so I I don't know. Yeah, they need. A, I hope they track these people down. Yep. Take care, guys. Peace.